Hey, 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 Lab here, back in the saddle, bringing you the latest in Starbase and space news. And this week at Starbase, Block 3 design testing continues at the Massey Outpost, the air separation plant is a hive of activity, and the last of the scaffolding is removed from around Ship 39's thermal protection tiles. Did SpaceX end up retiling any sections of the ship, or have some tiles been intentionally removed like we've seen on previous ships? Well, let's dig into this week's update and find out. Well, starting off this week with our fabrication updates, in the early hours of Saturday morning, crews were spotted welding around the bottom of the skirt on Ship 39.1's test tank as they prepare the article for its upcoming test campaign. In the early hours of Monday morning, the scaffolding was taken down from around Ship 39 as crews had apparently finished their work on the heat shield, which did not include a full replacement. And about 24 hours later, a pipe assembly was lifted up near one of Ship 39's aft flaps. Later on Tuesday morning, a ship lifting jig was raised up by one of the building's bridge cranes and hooked up to Ship 39 on the center work stand. That evening, a new ship aft section made a brief appearance in the ring yard before being taken back inside of Star Factory. Construction of the Starbase Gigabay continues at a steady pace. This week saw the arrival of a few construction elevators to the site to assist crews in getting up to the higher levels as the structure continues to grow upward. And checking things out at the launch site, the reconfiguration of Pad 1 pushed onward with the final two tanks from the Deluge farm being removed and driven out of Starbase. The methane recondenser tank and its vent stack were also removed and trucked out of the site. Early on Saturday, the crane was disconnected from the extension on the Pad 2 ship quick disconnect arm, indicating that installation was now complete. Around that same time, the 20th and final clamp arm was lifted into the center of the Pad 2 launch mount for installation. Later in the week, some of the linkages for the clamp arms were lifted to be joined to the recently installed hardware. Rebar and forms for a new concrete wall at the edge of the launch site started to go up on Monday. By Wednesday, a pipe truck was on site and got to work pouring the first section of the new wall before packing up and heading out. On Tuesday, a new Grove mobile crane arrived and was driven into the launch complex to assist in the ongoing work. Over at the air separation unit site, a small tank was lifted and installed near the pumps and multiple sections of piping were connected to the pumps as crews continued to develop the commodity production plant there. Now, some apparent ground stabilization work was performed at the site's entrance on Monday, likely in preparation of the arrival of the large SpaceX crawler crane from the launch site. Later that afternoon, that crane was laid down in preparation for its upcoming move across the road. The next day, derrick parts and a counterweight tray arrived at the site, indicating that the crane will be in a different configuration for its work at the air separation plant site. That evening, the crane raised its newly installed derrick. It was then picked up by transporters and driven across the road to continue its reconfiguration. Up the highway at the Massey Outpost, SpaceX continues to build out the new truss structure with a new cross brace being lifted and installed on it this week. The crawler crane was busy installing the tie downs connecting the can crusher cap to the base in preparation for the testing on test tank B18.3 with the installed ship aft on top of it. We also saw a new vaporizer being installed in the methane farm at the site as SpaceX continues to prepare for the ship static fire station to return to action. Moving on to testing and vehicle rollouts for the week, on Sunday the Ship 39.1 test tank was moved out of Mega Bay 2 and taken to the Massey Outpost for testing. And later on in the week, the ship's static fire stand was moved out of Massey's and taken up the road to the Sanchez site to await the eventual testing of Ship 39. The B18.1 test tank underwent a 16th round of testing at Massey's on Wednesday evening as SpaceX continues the process of validating the Block 3 design. Back at the launch complex, the Pad 2 chopsticks underwent some fresh actuation testing on Monday. And a few days later, both of the booster quick disconnects underwent testing as they were opened and extended multiple times. Checking out this week's Falcon 9 activity, the first launch of this week lifted off from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg Space Force Base. 
Booster 1097 launched the Twilight Rideshare mission, sending NASA's Pandora satellite, as well as over three dozen other payloads, on their way to the Sun's synchronous orbit. Several minutes later, the booster landed successfully at landing zone 4. The next day, Booster 1078 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 on its 25th mission as it carried another load of Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. Both the booster and the fairing halves were successfully recovered and returned to Port Canaveral for refurbishment. Exactly 45 hours later, SpaceX set a new pad turnaround record as Booster 1085 blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 for the week's second Starlink mission. The ability to reuse this pad so quickly will likely be crucial for SpaceX to maintain their planned launch cadence, with Launch Complex 39A being reserved for Falcon Heavy missions in the near future. Finally for Falcon 9 this week, late on Friday, SpaceX launched their second return to launch site mission of the week from Vandenberg. The NROL-105 mission lifted off on Booster 1100, successfully delivering a new batch of reconnaissance satellites to low Earth orbit before touching back down at landing zone 4. Now moving on to other space updates, on Tuesday, the main part of the ship quick disconnect arm was lifted and installed on the Starship launch tower at Launch Complex 39A. And later on in the week, a crane was spotted lifting clamp arms to the pad's launch mount for installation as build-out of the Starship infrastructure at the Cape continues. On Monday, NASA announced that astronaut Mike Fink had handed over command of the International Space Station in preparation for his departure. We were also informed that the Crew-12 mission is scheduled to stay on the station for nine months, not the six we typically see. On Tuesday afternoon, Crew-11 undocked from the space station and began the return journey to Earth. Less than 12 hours later, the Dragon capsule splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, bringing their mission to a close. NASA also shared footage this week of the demolition of both the propulsion and structural test facility and the dynamic test facility at their Marshall Space Flight Center. The old structures were removed as part of a project to revamp the flight center with a look towards the future of space exploration. The directors of NASA's Planetary Science Division said this week that while they haven't stopped trying yet, it's unlikely that they'll re-establish communication with the MAVEN Mars Orbiter, which had been in service for more than a decade around the Red Planet. The biggest news of the week came as of yesterday morning when NASA rolled out its Space Launch System, or SLS, as the agency prepares for the Artemis II mission, the next major step in returning humans to the moon. Now, Artemis II will be the first crewed mission of the Artemis program, with NASA's mission commander Reed Wiseman, pilot Victor Glover, mission specialist Christina Hammock Koch, and Canadian mission specialist Jeremy Hansen launching aboard NASA's Orion spacecraft and travel thousands of miles beyond the moon, performing a lunar flyby before returning safely to Earth. The mission objectives are to test Orion's life support systems, navigation, and heat shields with astronauts on board for the first time, and to orbit the moon, of course. The rollout of the massive SLS rocket marks a critical milestone, bringing the mission one step closer to launch. And standing more than 320 feet tall, SLS is the most powerful rocket NASA has ever built and will carry Orion and its crew on this historic journey. Boeing announced that it has added strakes to the SLS rocket, which will hopefully lead to a smoother ride for the astronauts on the Artemis II mission than what was observed for the rocket for the unmanned Artemis I mission. NASA Administrator Jared Isaacman met the representatives from SpaceX and Blue Origin this week as he settles into his new role and seeks to understand the current plans to accelerate the much-delayed Artemis timeline. The Indian Space Research Organization launched a rideshare mission this week on their PSLV DL rocket. Unfortunately, following the shutdown of the rocket's third stage, it began to spin uncontrollably, causing the vehicle to deviate from its planned trajectory. The fourth stage was able to separate and light its engines, but was not able to successfully regain attitude control and complete the mission. Despite their failure of the mission, Orbital Paradigm announced that their KID space capsule, a subscale mock-up of their Kestrel reusable capsule, had survived and been able to transmit data. Now, while they were unable to recover any customer data, the capsule did manage to complete four out of five mission objectives and prove out their design in conditions significantly worse than it was designed for. 
Relativity Space released a short update video on their December progress for their Terran R rocket development. The company is simultaneously working on testing hardware, Flight 1 hardware, and now even Flight 2 hardware. Meanwhile, engine testing is ongoing at the Stennis Space Center while they continue to build out both their testing infrastructure there as well as their launch complex in Florida. Firefly Aerospace announced that the upcoming seventh launch on their Alpha rocket will be the final flight for their current configuration and Flight 8 will be the debut of the Block 2 version of the rocket. The new version will be longer and stronger and will feature consolidated batteries and avionics that were built in-house as well as optimized propellant tanks. The avionics and improved thermal protection for the propellant tanks have been added to the Flight 7 vehicle for testing. Korean Air and Hyundai Rotom are working together to develop a reusable 35-ton class methane rocket engine. The European Space Agency announced that their Plato Space Telescope has completed vibration and acoustic testing. Now, if everything continues as planned, the mission should launch about a year from now to begin searching for Earth-like planets among the stars. Canadian aerospace company Nord Space announced that their in-house vibration testing facility is now operational as the company looks to optimize their design, build, test, and launch cycle time. Blue Origin announced that the sample delivery carousel for NASA's Dragonfly mission is en route to Goddard Space Flight Center for integration with the Dragonfly mass spectrometer and environmental testing. CEO Dave Limp said that they've completed acoustic testing on their Blue Moon MK-1 lunar lander while they work towards the first launch of the lander hopefully later this year. Eastasat has begun the process of commissioning Spainsat NG-3 after they determined that NG-2 will not be able to complete its mission following its recent impact with a space particle. ESAR Aerospace announced that they are preparing for the second launch of their Spectrum rocket as early as this coming Wednesday in hopes of reaching orbit for the first time. Utilsat has signed a deal with Maya Space to launch multiple OneWeb missions on the company's underdevelopment Maya rocket. And finally for this week, Rocket Lab posted that they are in the process of testing Neutron's thrust structure at their facility in Middle River, Maryland, working towards the rocket's inaugural launch later this year. Well, that's going to do it for this week's jam-packed Avid Space Update. Now, make sure you go check out our new website for new and upcoming space news articles. And don't forget to check out our merch store where you can pick up your Avid Space and Lab Padre swag. Until next time, we'll see you next week.